to introduce David C. Levin of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who will deliver this year's annual oration in diagnostic radiology, transitioning from volume-based to value-based practice, a meaningful goal for all radiologists or a meaning, meaningless platitude. Dr. Levin is professor and chairman emeritus of the Department of Radiology at Jefferson Medical College and Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. He is regarded as an expert in health policy and practice, with recent research focusing on the utilization and costs of imaging procedures, the effects of self-referral, and practice patterns in medical imaging. Dr. Levin established the Jefferson Center for Research on Utilization of Imaging Services. He received his bachelor's degree from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. Before medical school, he served as a jet fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. Dr. Levin began his academic career at Cornell University Medical College in New York and also spent more than a decade in the Department of Radiology at Harvard Medical School and the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston before coming to Jefferson Medical College. Dr. Levin has served RSNA as third vice president and on numerous committees and annual meeting faculty and was awarded an RSNA gold medal in 2009. He has also received gold medals from the American Rentgen Ray Society, the American College of Radiology, the Association of University Radiologists, and the Society of Interventional Radiology. In 2008, an endowed chair was established in his honor at Thomas Jefferson University. Henceforth, the chair of the Department of Radiology is known as the David C. Levin Professor and Chair of Radiology Endowed Chair. Let's give Dr. Levin a warm welcome as presenter of this year's annual oration in diagnostic radiology. Reed, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And uh, my thanks to the RSNA for extending me this privilege and honor of giving this annual oration on such an auspicious occasion, the centennial year of this great meeting, the largest meeting, the largest medical meeting in the entire world, I do believe. I would also like to thank one member of the RSNA board in particular, my colleague and friend, Dr. V.J. Rao, with whom I've worked closely on health policy issues and health services research for a number of years. BJ has made some contributions to some of the ideas I'm going to express here this afternoon. Although I, I, have, to, I have to add that if you don't like what I'm going to say, and you may not like what I'm going to say, the blame is all on me, okay? These are my disclosures. I'm a consultant to Health Help, one of the RBMs, and on the board of directors of uh, OIA, an operator of outpatient uh, imaging centers. I should also mention that, uh, uh, as Reed said, I went to Johns Hopkins Medical School where Henry Wagner was one of my teachers. He was uh, truly a superb educator and a superb scientist, so it's a special privilege for me to be able to give this lecture in his memory. Now, back 100 years ago, when this meeting was first held, things were certainly a lot different. Back then, this was what was considered high-tech. This Rube Goldberg-like contraption was the first portable x-ray machine built by Dr. William Coolidge in 1914. Back then, x-rays were a curiosity. And you could see ads like this in the newspapers about a magical new beam that enabled you to see through clothing. Wasn't that sexy? Now, I don't know who this little guy is here, 
but uh, he clearly wants to become a radiology resident, right? Uh, notice also that you could get an imaging, an imaging test for $1.98. I think that uh, at the rate things are going, uh, if CMS has its way, they might try to get us back to this era of reimbursement before too much longer. Okay, now fast forward 100 years to the present time. Everyone in medicine is being admonished to make the transition from volume-based to value-based practice. I think in this regard, we in radiology stand at somewhat of a crossroads, or maybe it'd be better to call it a fork in the road with two possible paths to choose from. One path is that of apathy, opting for the status quo, maybe hiding behind a few convenient slogans. One such slogan might be imaging 3.0, a term we hear just about every single day. Now, don't get me wrong. I happen to like the idea of imaging 3.0 a lot. And I give Bib Allen great credit for having thought it up. The problem is that we hear that term bandied about too much without enough thought being given to what is really behind it and what it requires us to do. The other path is that of taking truly meaningful action to transform and improve the way we practice, to make ourselves better doctors, real doctors, if you will, who provide real value to patients, to referring physicians, and to our hospitals. That, I believe, is the path we have to take. And so my goal this afternoon, over the next 40 minutes or so, is to present some practical, concrete ideas for actions that I think radiologists must take in order to get us there. It's particularly important that we do that for a number of reasons. One of them is that um, there are many other people out there in the healthcare industry who don't have a real favorable impression of radiologists. They see radiologists as overpaid, not interested in their lifestyles, not real doctors, unnecessary middlemen, they see radiologists as not caring about their patients. They see them as people who sit in dark rooms, churning out reports, and not doing a whole lot else to add value. And of course, they think imaging is easy and that anybody can do it without benefit of rigorous training. So this perception is one of our problems, but there are others as well. And here are some of them, not all of them, but some of them, declining reimbursements the perception that a lot of imaging is inappropriate or unnecessary, increasing emphasis on utilization management, tougher demands by hospitals in contract negotiations, uh, the termination of radiology groups by some hospitals, and their replacement by teleradiology companies, turf losses, we're all familiar with those, and last but not least, commoditization. So, you might ask yourself, or we might ask ourselves, what do these threats have in common? And unfortunately, I think the answer is that to a large extent, we have brought them on ourselves. Some years ago, back in uh, 2008, Dr. Jim Borkstead published a very perceptive article in the Gray Journal in, in which he posed the question as to whether radiology is a specialty or a commodity. And he pointed out that to be a true specialty requires the integration of four components of radiologic practice. The pre-exam evaluation of the requests that come in for necessity and appropriateness. Monitoring of the exam quality as the study is actually being carried out. Interpretation of exam results. And post-exam consultation with the patient and the referring physician. The problem, of course, is that radiologists often don't do three of these four things. Now let's, for example, compare what happens to a hypothetical patient who gets referred to a cardiology group for a cardiac evaluation with what might happen to that same patient when he or she gets referred to a radiology group for an imaging evaluation. When the patient goes to the cardiology group, there are certain values or valuable services 
that that patient receives. And I'm, I, I show you those here in the left-hand column. So when the patient goes to the cardiology group, yes, a cardiologist meets the patient. A cardiologist does a history and physical. A cardiologist does, uh, selects the appropriate study, whatever that test might be. It might be an imaging test. It might be something else. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes a cardiologist will supervise the tech while the study is being done. A cardiologist dictates the report, gives the results directly to the patient, person to person, and then finally plans a further course of action with the patient or with the patient's referring physician. Now, when that patient goes to a radiology group, by contrast, except for breast imaging and interventional radiology, none of those things happen except for the dictation of a report. None of those things happen. And that is what leads to the commoditization of our field. We have become, we have let ourselves become the invisible doctors, and that is something that none of us are happy about. So the question is, how do we reverse this perception that radiologists are just purveyors of a commodity and instead create a new perception that we add real value to the patient care process? Let me back up just a second. Yeah. Right. Well, I think the first and most important thing that we can do to add value, which is what the goal of all this is, uh, the, the most important thing that we could do is to act more like true consulting physicians. We have to go back to the ideas that Jim Borgstead was talking about. We have to go back to those values that the hypothetical cardiologists provide to their patients. We've got to act more like true consulting physicians. This is the single most important point that I want to get across this afternoon. So how can we do that? How can we act more like true consulting physicians? Well, there are several ways that we could do that. One way is to screen requests for advanced imaging for appropriateness, instead of just going ahead and doing the study with no questions asked. So now let's uh, pose the question, would it be feasible to do that? Would it be feasible to screen all requests for advanced imaging studies for appropriateness? And I think if you think about it, the answer is it probably wouldn't be feasible for us to try to do that in every single case. It just, it would, it would not work. Uh, it would alienate a lot of our referring physicians. Certainly we can evaluate some of them, the problematic ones, but I don't think we can try to evaluate all of them. As I say, it would alienate our referring doctors, it would create delays in the middle of a busy day, and so on and so forth. But still, I think there are ways that we have to establish ourselves as the final authorities uh, on appropriateness, and there are ways for us to do that. For example, we have to do more to publicize the ACR appropriateness criteria. We have to educate our referring physicians about the Choosing Wisely campaign. We have to implement clinical decision support after making sure it works. Now, the reason uh, I use that term, making sure it works, is that, uh, as I think many of you know, the Medicare imaging demonstration trial results were just announced about two weeks ago. This was a large-scale trial of imaging decision support, and unfortunately, the results were kind of disappointing. So it's clear that some, a lot, maybe even a lot more work has to be done. This is a very complicated subject, and I'm not going to try to cover it anymore today, but I do want to make a couple of quick comments about these first two items. The ACR did a great thing 20-some years ago when they developed the appropriateness criteria. This was really a first-class product, and it continues to be that today. The problem is that Almost no people, no physicians outside of the radiology community know about the ACR's appropriateness criteria. That's a real problem. If you read the JACR, you know that every month there, are, there is one article every month in the JACR about one of the more prominent appropriateness criteria. And those articles are top notch. They're extremely informative and helpful. I would like to see those articles published also in the applicable specialty journals 
and in the primary care journals. That's where our target audience is. They're the people who really need to know about these appropriateness criteria. And that's why I say I think we ought to try to publish those articles in those journals in addition to the JACR. Now, if that were not possible because of, let's say, copyright concerns or whatever, there's still things that we could do. For example, we could publish editorials in uh, those journals about the existence of the appropriateness criteria. Encourage the readers to go and, and uh, go to the website. Or we could even take out ads in those journals. The same thing. Whether it's an editorial or an advertisement, the goal would be to familiarize the readers of those journals with the ACR appropriateness criteria and how to get to them and so on and so forth. This is the uh, URL that very quickly takes you to those appropriateness criteria. And, by doing that, we would be provide we would be, we'd be doing something to provide real value, and again, that's the goal. We also need to educate our referring physicians about the Choosing Wisely campaign. I imagine many of you uh, know what that is. The Choosing Wisely campaign was an initiative that uh, uh, first was uh, announced in April of 2012 under the auspices of the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation. What they did was they approached all the major national medical societies in the different specialties all around the country and asked each of them to identify five tests or procedures <clears throat> within their purview that they felt were uh, either overused or often unnecessary. Uh, well, initially, nine medical societies joined up as charter members, and to its credit, the ACR was one of those original nine. In the two and a half years since then, uh, there's been a flood of other medical societies that have joined up with the, uh, uh, the Choosing Wisely uh, initiative. Now there are 62 national medical societies in all different specialties that have joined. Um, now, remember, each of them have identified five things that they think are overused or often unnecessary. If you go through the 300 plus things that have been identified by those 62 societies, you find some rather startling and disconcerting things. Turns out that a lot of those things are imaging tests. And if you go through in even more detail, and you f you'll find that there are a lot of, there's a lot of duplication, there's a lot of overlap. If you eliminate all of the duplication and all of the overlap, and then you also eliminate 10 of the procedures that are echocardiograms or coronary angiograms that are done primarily or exclusively by cardiologists. You still are left with 72 studies, 72 imaging studies that are felt to be overused or often unnecessary. Now these are imaging studies, of course, that are in specific clinical circumstances. But 72, that is, that is a huge number. And that is something we all really have to worry about. I think uh, if we want to claim to provide value as radiologists, we need to familiarize ourselves with all 72 of those tests. And we need to publicize them among our referring physicians. And we need to try to do everything we possibly can to eliminate their use or at least minimize their use. If we do that, will be providing real value. Another way we could act more like true consulting physicians would be to supervise and monitor every advanced imaging exam as it is being conducted. So here again, let's ask the question, is that feasible? Is it feasible for a radiologist to supervise the performance of every advanced imaging study? And I think again, the answer is no, that would not be feasible. We can't. We can't have a radiologist sitting at the console of a CT scanner all day long and monitoring and supervising the text. But again, there are alternatives. So for example, I could foresee, or I would hope that uh, we could have a situation where a radiologist on any given clinical service would hold an early morning huddle with the text to review any questions that they might have about the day's schedule or to go over in more detail any uh, unusual cases. Those early, early morning huddles, I think, would add a lot of value to the, the process. Uh, a radiologist, the supervising radiologist, could make uh, him or herself more readily available to the techs if any question comes up 
and encourage the text to call them during the course of a day if questions arise. Uh, we could continually update advanced imaging protocols and even more important, standardize them all across the board. And we could provide frequent feedback to the technologists, both oral and written. And I think by doing these things, again, we would be adding real value to the process. Another way we could act more like true consulting physicians is to communicate more with our patients, give them direct access to their results, either verbally or through an electronic portal. This is so important. Uh, you know, if you ask the question, is it feasible to give patients access to these results verbally or through a portal? I say not only is it feasible, but it's going to become state of the art probably within one or two years. No question about that. I believe also that at the end of every report that a radiologist dictates, that those radiologists should provide their cell phone number and their email address, and they should encourage the patients to contact them if necessary. Okay, now that might sound heretical to some people. The early adopters of this approach, and there have been a few, have found that very few patients will actually contact you. They will be more likely to, to go to their primary care physician with any questions. But the point is that by putting into that report or at the end of that report your cell phone number and your email address, you are showing that patient that there's a real doctor on the other end of that report who cares about the patient and who is there to help out, to, to help answer questions if that patient has them. I think that's something that would provide real value. Talking to patients. Murray Janauer suggested this in 1996. We haven't been very good at taking him up on that idea over the years, but I think it's a great idea that we do more of that. If we can't talk to every single patient, which we probably really can't do, at least we should talk to those who specifically hope to see us or who ask to see us. Another thing that I think we need to do, and I think this is extremely important, we need to take over responsibility for contacting patients when they are due for follow-up imaging exams. You know that there are computer programs now available that make this relatively easy and that will allow us to do this. Up until now, we have sort of pushed off that responsibility on the primary care physicians. It's not, I don't think it's appropriate that we do that anymore in this day and age. We are real doctors. We have a responsibility to take care of our patients, certainly in terms of their, their imaging care. So I believe we ought to take over that responsibility from the primary care physicians, follow them up, notify them, get in touch with them, make sure they get that follow-up imaging study that, need, that they need. In other words, we need to start managing the imaging care of our patients. That, again, is a way to provide real value. Another thing that we can do to act more like true consulting physicians is to make ourselves more readily available to consult with our referring physicians. Now, of course, that's motherhood and apple pie. I'm not telling anybody new when I say that. But even there, there are ways that we could improve the process a little bit. Uh, my friends Joe Stock and Rich Taxon at uh, Crozier Chester Medical Center in Philadelphia came up with uh, this idea, which I think is a really good idea, and that is to have uh, a consultant of the day. The way that would work, ideally, would be to have a consultant of the day in every clinical subspecialty of radiology. So you'd have a consultant of the day in, in the neuro division, in the MSK division, and so on and so forth. Maybe in smaller groups, you might just have one consultant of the day for the entire department. But these consultants wouldn't be just twiddling their, their thumbs. Uh, they would be reading cases most of the time during that day while they're on. But they would sit at clearly identified workstations in the radiology department with phone numbers that have been publicized throughout the hospital. So that anybody needing help in, one, in whatever of those divisions we happen to be talking about, whether it's neuro or abdomen or whatever, could just pick up the phone and get that consultant. Because again, those phone numbers would have been widely publicized. Here again, experience has shown that while this is popular with the referring physicians, it really isn't very intrusive for the consultant of the day. They don't get that many phone calls. They get some, but not that many. 
not only that, the consultant of the day uh, could also be available to any of the techs who had questions. So this is a way, again, to provide real value, to be better consultants than we are doing right now at the present time. So we've talked here about ways that radiologists could provide more value by acting like true consulting physicians. And we've talked about screening requests for advanced imaging studies, supervising the performance uh, of those studies, standardizing the protocols, giving the patients access to results, managing uh, their follow-up imaging care, and being more readily available to consult with referring physicians. Now, I can almost bet that there are people in this audience right now who are saying to themselves, we can't possibly do all those non-revenue producing things because that would take time away from reading cases and being productive. I'm sure that there are some people in this audience who are thinking that. If you are, I would ask that you consider the words of Dr. John Patty. John, as I think most of you know, is a past president and chairman of the Board of Chancellors of the ACR, and in May of 2013, he gave a very eloquent presidential address to the annual ACR meeting. It was later published in the JACR. And this is what he said, a direct quote from that address. He asked, what would happen to us if we allocated some percentage, say 10%, of the radiologist workforce in each practice to engage in non-revenue producing work? The immediate effect is that our incomes would decrease by 10%. Would that kill us? I think not. Radiologists in the U.S. are still among the highest paid physicians in the world. Could it help secure our future? I think so. That time could be used to truly consult with our medical colleagues, explain the meaning of our reports, design a, a proper approach to guide diagnosis and management, interact directly with patients, answering their questions and thereby increasing their level of understanding of who we are and why we do what we, what we do. Think about those words. And then consider the words of Dr. Geraldine McGinty. I think most of you know that Dr. McGinty is currently the chair of the Commission on Economics of the ACR. She writes a monthly column in the ACR Bulletin. And this is something that she wrote back in the March of 2013. Again, a direct quote from that article. So while, radiologi so while the radiologist of the past clings to the notion that reading more cases will help make up for decreased unit reimbursement, the radiologist of the future plays a pivotal role in directing appropriate imaging utilization to ensure that only those studies that can deliver the most effective information are performed. The radiologist of the past hunkers down over his PAX workstation and doesn't have time to talk to anyone. The radiologist of the future attends rounds and regularly makes visits to the exam room to elicit more history from a patient or discuss a result. So what doctors Patty and McGinty have said essentially is that radiologists have to act more like true consulting physicians. And they are absolutely right, and that is a way to provide real value. Now, if you still resent the idea of being asked to take time away from reading cases to do non-revenue producing work, I'd call your attention to this article by Barron et al. in the New England Journal back in 2010. Dr. Barron is the head of a primary care internal medicine group in Philadelphia called the Greenhouse Internists. What they did in this study was they carefully tracked the daily activities of every internist in that primary care group, and then they tabulated them, and they came out with this table. This is a table taken directly from that article. Uh, now, here's what they found. This is, these are the daily activities of a typical physician in that primary care internal medicine group. The, the typical physician saw 18, had 18 patient visits each day. Now, those 18 patient visits were what brought in the revenue. But in addition to those visits, they also performed a whole lot of additional services for their patients that they didn't get paid one cent to do. So, for example, they handled 24 telephone calls relating to patient care. They refilled 12 prescriptions. They... Uh, responded to 17 email messages, again, pertaining to patient care. They uh, digested and acted upon 20 lab reports 
11 imaging reports, and 14 consultation reports. Now, you add those numbers up, and they add up to almost 100 unpaid services every day that those physicians performed on behalf of their patients. Why do they do it? Because that's what real doctors do. They take care of their patients. They provide services to those patients, even if they don't get paid for it, and they do it without whining about it. I think we in radiology, if we consider ourselves real doctors, we have to uh, do the same thing. We also have to remember George Bissett's theme for this meeting back in 2012, Patients First. And we have to remember a current major initiative of the RSNA, Radiology Cares. We have to make those words truly meaningful. Another way that radiologists could uh, add more value is by being available to their patients and referring physicians around the clock, 365 days a year. And that means stopping outsourcing night and weekend work to the teleradiology companies. Take back the nights and the weekends. Why do that? Well, for one thing, it would certainly help to spell the notion that radiology is just a commodity. It would also, uh, well, another, another reason I think we should do this, uh, and one of my prime gripes against the teleradiology companies, is that they devalue what we do as radiologists. The reason I say that is this, a teleradiology company will have a board certified radiologist read an MRI scan for $25 to $35, okay? Meanwhile, Medicare, for that same service, is paying somewhere between $70 and $100 professional component. Now, it doesn't take much of a stretch to imagine what must go through the minds of the Medicare people or the commercial payers when they realize this. They say to themselves, you know, if the value of a read of an MRI scan by a board-certified radiologist is worth only $25 to $35, why am I paying three times as much? And I think that may be one of the prime reasons why our fees have been continuously ratcheted down over the years. I think by outsourcing night and weekend work to the teleradiology companies, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Another problem with those companies is they emphasize high volume and fast reads. This can lead to more mistakes. I think it would be far preferable for radiology groups, rather than spending money, sending that money to the teleradiology companies, I would like to see those groups hire more young radiologists. Or maybe if it's a small group, they could consider consolidating and then hiring young radiologists. What would these new hires do? Well, for one thing, they could give the radiologists in the group time to act more like true consultants, time to do the things that we've been talking about for the last 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, it would also uh, enable the group to develop their own in-house night and emergency radiology section. It would provide more subspecialty expertise. All of these things provide more value. And maybe even most important, it would create new jobs for young radiologists who are having so much trouble finding jobs now. I believe we owe this to our younger colleagues. Now, I'd like to tell you two quick stories about outsourcing night and weekend work. Um, the first story comes from an article by Dr. Cindy Sherry in the JACR back in 2010, and she talked about her own group's experience with outsourcing. At that time, Cindy was the head of a large community hospital group in Dallas, Texas, the Presbyterian Hospital System. And in addition to covering Presbyterian, their group had contracts to cover a number of outlying hospitals. When they announced that they were outsourcing their night and weekend work to a teleradiology company, some of the referring physicians at one of the hospitals got so angry and raised such a stink that the group lost that hospital contract. Now, this damaged their reputation, and they failed to win some other contracts that they had bid on. They had to let some radiologists go. They lost some credibility with their main hospital administration at Presbyterian. A local TV station ran an unflattering story about doctors who abrogate their night and weekend responsibility. Turned out to be a bad deal financially. 
They had to pay out you know, a fair amount of money for the night coverage, but uh, their night population was poorly insured, so they didn't make up uh, the revenue shortfall. And finally, uh, Dr. Sherry concluded with a, a direct quote here. She said, all of this reinforced the impression that we were not a necessary part of the medical team. We became more ancillary, nameless, and faceless shift workers, viewed as abandoning our colleagues and our patients. And that's some story, isn't it? Well, si well since then, uh, Dr. Sherry has told me that uh, they have brought that night and weekend work back in-house. The other story is contained in an email from Dr. Tim Hall. Tim Hall is a radiologist in Boise, Idaho. And back in 2008, there was an email train going around about the pros and cons of outsourcing night and weekend work. And Tim sent in an email as part of that train that was going around. Now, this is a direct screen capture uh, of that uh, email, but to make it a little bit easier to read, I'll magnify it here. I'm, I'm reading a direct quote from this entire email. So here's what he said. Following this thread from rural Boise has been very interesting. Twelve years ago, our group decided to initiate in-house call. We've been at it ever since. Our after-hours practice continues to grow, and now our night call guy is by far and away our most productive radiologist. We have 15 members who share in night call duty. Initially, it was eight. Um, we have expanded, and I would say that our presence has become indispensable to the medical community. We consistently score the highest scores in staff satisfaction surveys. While the personal toll is great, the professional satisfaction more than offsets that toll. And he continues, we are identified by the medical staff as a can-do group, and as we are in the trenches, are identified along with our trauma surgeons, our neurosurgeons, intensivists, and our ED docs as the hardest working physicians on the medical staff. Radiologists nationwide need to wake up and realize that being identified as the highest paid of medical specialists with the most time off is an honor of dubious distinction. We can achieve both if we continue to pursue medical and professional excellence. Now, I'd be willing to bet anybody in this theater two things about this practice in Boise, Idaho. Number one, I'll bet that nobody in that hospital in Boise views radiology as a commodity. And number two, I'll bet that Tim Hall's group never loses the radiology contract to a competing radiology group or a teleradiology company. Because they have shown that medical community that they put the needs of their patients and their referring physicians ahead of their own personal convenience. They add real value. And there's a good lesson there for a lot of other people in the radiology community. A third way that radiology groups could provide more value would be by developing and tracking their own internal quality metrics and then publicizing them, of course. Quality metrics, I believe, are extremely important. To prove value, you have to prove quality. And to prove quality, you've got to be able to measure it. You know, you can't just sort of beat your breast and proclaim to the rest of the world that you provide high quality imaging, right? I mean, everybody says that. When was the last time you heard anybody advertise the fact that they provide mediocre quality radiology, right? Everybody provides high quality radiology. So those words don't mean a damn thing, right? Um, I think that every radiology practice should choose somewhere between 10 and 20 quality metrics that are true indicators of quality and that are trackable and then track them. I emphasize the word true because there are a lot of quality metrics out there that I find pretty much useless. So you have to be very selective and pick the ones that really mean something. There's some people around the country who are actually doing a very good job of this. Uh, with quality dashboards, and I think of people like uh, Paul Nagy at Johns Hopkins, Johnny Kruskal at Beth Israel Deaconess, Michael Recht at NYU, and Daniel Johnson at the Mayo Clinic. Doing these things, uh, doing you know what I'm talking about here with a quality metrics is, a, again, a way to provide real value. There are sources of ideas if you are interested in 
in looking at the quality metrics that have been proposed, there are these sources, the radiology literature, the authors that I just mentioned, the, phys the PQRS program, the Physician's Quality Reporting System. I put a question mark there because that is where some of the kind of questionable metrics reside. The hospital, the HOQR, Hospital Outpatient Quality Reporting System, and its hospital compare website. That's a mandatory reporting system for all hospitals. The hospitals themselves submit the data, but uh, there are six specific imaging metrics in there, and I would urge everybody to go to this website and look at how your own performance shapes up against the national bench benchmarks, because you can do that. The uh, ACR's National Radiology Data Registry, the NRDR, uh, that's an umbrella registry for six sub-registries, which I have listed here. Um, that is, again, a very good source of, uh, of good quality metrics. The quality metrics are embedded within these... Uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, went forward instead of backward. The quality metrics are embedded within... Uh, uh, these six sub-registries, the CT colonography registry, the dose index registry, national mammography database, general radiology improvement database, intravenous contrast extravasation registry, and the national oncologic pet registry. Embedded in there, again, there are a lot of good ideas on quality metrics. The advisory board, a large national consulting company, they've identified a number of good quality metrics. And finally, the ACR's Future Trends Committee. Uh, I happen to be familiar with the Future Trends Committee because I co-chair that committee along with Frank Lexa, and uh, our committee spent a fair amount of time discussing uh, possibilities for good, useful quality metrics. We came up with 15. Here are just five quick examples. Uh, the positivity rate for advanced imaging studies, the frequency of procedural complications, the percent of patients who undergo breast biopsy following an abnormal screening mammogram who actually end up being diagnosed with breast cancer. The frequency with which an interpreting radiologist recommends an additional study. And the percent of imaging exams performed that were rated low value by a decision support system if you're using a decision support system. So these are just five examples from our committee. I think it would be a great idea if uh, maybe the ACR or the RSNA or the two together could work to develop a standardized set of really good, useful quality metrics that could then be used by all practices. This is something that I think would add a tremendous amount of value. A fourth way that radiologists could provide more value would be by building closer ties to our colleagues in primary care the primary care physicians, the, also the nurse practitioners who work with them, the physician assistant, assistants, and I would also include hospitalists and ED physicians in that group as well. We need to build closer ties to these people. One of the main reasons for doing that is that the PCPs and, of course, their nurse practitioners and PAs are going to become increasingly influential as ACOs and bundled payments and capitation plans take hold. They are going to be calling a lot of the shots, and we have to recognize that. Maybe even more importantly, they need our help, and we need to give it to them. We need to help them become more familiar with principles and techniques and uh, vehicles for utilization management through such things as those I mentioned before, the ACR appropriateness criteria, the Choosing Wisely lists and clinical decision support. Dr. Rob Millman had a very good idea. Dr. Millman is uh, a radiologist uh, with the Austin Radiological Association in Texas. I don't know him personally, but he and I have exchanged some emails. And um, I did it again. Uh, going the wrong way. Excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, Dr. Millman came up with the idea of developing CME lectures, uh, which he then gave to groups of primary care physicians and nurse practitioners, hospital administrators, um, PAs, various groups like this in the Austin area. He's given a number of these lectures, and he says they're very well received, and I believe him. I think that... Uh, 
these groups, these people in primary care and hospital administrations uh, would, be, uh, would, would really welcome uh, advice from radiologists. And he talks to them about things like imaging appropriateness, the value of imaging, and the downside of overutilization. So by doing this, by taking the time out of his practice to do this, he is providing, again, real value. And I would like to see more radiologists doing the same kind of thing. Finally, we might propose something that could be called the 90% rule. Now, the 90% rule says that if you take a primary care group, put it together with a radiology group and a clinical lab, that triad working together could solve 90% of the, clinical, the serious clinical problems that come to the attention of that primary care physician group, 90%. Now, you could quibble with me as to whether the correct number is 90% or whether maybe it should be 85 or 80%. The fact of the matter is that triad working together could solve the vast majority of the serious diagnostic problems facing those primary care physicians. If we could promulgate that idea, what, what could then happen is that the patients wouldn't have to get sent to specialist physicians until the diagnosis had already been made. We would make it in conjunction with the primary care doctors and the clinical lab. Just think of all the money and time that would save the healthcare system. Not only that, I think if we could successfully promulgate that idea, we would end up doing more imaging rather than less. I think this whole idea could provide a whole lot of value. So if I had to summarize what I've been talking about here uh, and uh, provide maybe a few bullets on how radiologists can make the V to V transition, volume to value. Here's how I would summarize them very quickly. Remember George Bissett's theme for RSNA 2012, patients first. We've got to keep that in mind. And the RSNA's current initiative, Radiology Cares. We need to behave more like true consulting physicians. We need to be willing to accept some small reduction in income. We need to focus on quality, not so much on dollars. We need to take back the nights and the weekends. We need to do everything possible to eliminate unnecessary imaging studies. And we need to build those bridges to our primary care colleagues. I believe that if all radiology groups followed the advice of the people that I've quoted here this afternoon, Drs. Borgsted, Bissett, Patty, McGinty, Sherry, and Hall, and all of the others, I think that this is what our field could look like in five years. We would no longer be viewed as a commodity. Referring physicians would see us as contributing real value. They would look to us for guidance on imaging instead of just going ahead willy-nilly and ordering the tests. Patients would know who we are and respect us as real doctors. Groups would no longer be losing their hospital contracts. There would be full employment for young radiologists. And maybe, just maybe, as a result of our newfound respect, there would be no further reimbursement cuts directed at us. Ladies and gentlemen, this can be our future. Just think of that. This could be our future. But it's only going to happen if we change the way we do business, if we do the kinds of things that we've been talking about here this afternoon. It's not going to happen if we just sit back and opt for the status quo and let good ideas like Imaging 3.0 and Radiology Cares become just a couple of meaningless platitudes. You know, if you think about it, it all boils down to one relatively simple question. And that question is this. Are radiologists going to be willing to sacrifice a small portion of their incomes and some personal convenience in order to be able to do these things that provide real value, these things that will save our profession from commoditization and disrespect? Are radiologists going to be willing to do that? That is the big question. And I believe that the way the radiology community chooses to answer that question 
over the next couple of years is going to largely determine the fate and the future of our profession. Well, here's my contact information. I'd certainly welcome the opportunity to discuss this further with anybody who wants to do so. And again, my sincere thanks to the RSNA for giving me this opportunity to express my viewpoint. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. On behalf of the RSNA, it is my great pleasure to present you with this illuminated scroll commemorating your presentation of the annual oration in diagnostic radiology. This concludes today's plenary session.